Hi class! Your experiment this week is Atwood's machine. This experiment is important because it is the first to cover Newton's second law, net force equals mass times acceleration, one of the most important laws in all of physics. There's a good balance of theory, experiment, and analysis this week, and so that is why I would like you to write your first report on it. Atwood's machine uses a frictionless, massless pulley. No such pulley exists, so I'd like you to think about the limitations of real-world devices. A massless string is draped around the pulley, and it supports two masses, M1 and M2. For our system, I'll specify that M1 is greater than M2, which means that if the system starts at rest, we expect M1 to fall down and pull M2 up. M1 will accelerate downward, while M2 accelerates upward. We expect their accelerations to be equal because the string is inextensible. It doesn't get longer or shorter as it moves around the pulley. To analyze this system and make a prediction, our first step is to draw free body diagrams for all the masses. We're assuming the pulley is frictionless and massless, so the only free body diagrams we need to draw are for M1 and M2. M1 has the gravitational force acting down on it, and the tension force pulling it up. It accelerates downward, so the gravitational force must be stronger than the tension force. M2 also has its own gravitational force acting downward, and the same tension force acting upward. It accelerates upward, so the tension force must be stronger than its gravitational force. We use the same tension force for both masses because frictionless massless pulleys only redirect the tension force. Step 2 is to pick coordinate systems for each object. Because M1 accelerates downward, I'll choose Y1 to be positive in the downward direction. M2 accelerates upward, so I'll choose Y2 to be positive upward. Step 3 is to decompose all forces onto these coordinate systems. The Y1 component of M1's gravitational force is M1g, and the Y1 component of the tension force is negative T. It's negative because it points in the negative y1 direction. Meanwhile, the y2 component of the tension force is T, and the y2 component of M2's gravitational force is negative M2g. As with the y1 component of the tension force, M2's gravitational force is negative because it points in the negative y2 direction. Step 4 is to apply Newton's second law. Net force equals mass times acceleration. Our net force along the y1 axis acting on m1 is m1 times g minus t, which is equal to m1 times a. Our net force along the y2 axis acting on m2 is t minus m2 times g, which is equal to m2 times a. For this problem, we're done with the physics. We have two equations and two variables. The variables we would like to solve for are t and a. A little bit of algebra will show that t equals 2 times m1 times m2 times g, all divided by m1 plus m2. And a equals m1 minus m2 divided by m1 plus m2 times g. This last equation represents the chief prediction of the experiment. Your data should either support or refute this statement. And here's the equipment we'll be using this week. It consists of a pulley, a string, two mass hangers, and various masses. The pulley is connected to this interface, which sends a digital signal to the software we'll be using called Capstone. Here's a closer look at the pulley we'll be using in this week's experiment. It doesn't have much friction, and it doesn't weigh much, but it's neither frictionless nor massless. It has these little spokes on it which interrupt an infrared beam in the supporting structure, and how often it interrupts that beam tells the computer how fast it's spinning. If you look at the back side of the pulley, you can see this indicator light which turns on or off as the spokes interrupt the signal. This may help you get an understanding of how the computer takes its reading. The set of masses you're provided have nominal values of 20 grams, 10 grams, 5 grams, and 2 grams. On one mass hanger, place 40 grams, including all of the 2 gram masses. 
On the other mass hanger, you'll place the remaining 45 grams. Place both mass hangers and all of the masses on the scale to obtain a measurement of the total mass. You'll be using that value throughout the experiment. Then measure the mass hangers individually with their respective masses before you begin the first trial. Before you begin the experiment, check that the interface is turned on. Then double click the folder labeled Capstone Fizz 105L on the desktop and then open the file called Atwood. This opens Capstone, a piece of software we'll be using throughout the semester. Once it finishes loading, there may be some data already on the screen. I'd like you to delete that. Go down to Delete Last Run, click the arrow just to the right of it, and then click Delete All Runs. Now, set up your equipment. Have the heavier mass hanger up near the pulley, and the lighter mass hanger just off the floor. They may swing a little bit. I'd like you to prevent them from swinging too much because this could affect your measurement and they may run into one another. Once you're satisfied that everything is set up correctly, click record, release the string, and then catch the mass just before it hits the pulley. You can then click stop and this completes the first trial of your experiment. Between trials, transfer one 2 gram mass from the lighter mass hanger to the heavier one. Then separately mass each hanger to find an experimental value for their masses. Record at least 10 trials. By the time you're finished, all of the 2 gram masses should have been transferred from the lighter mass hanger to the heavier one. After performing all 10 trials, your next step is to analyze your data. The relevant portion of your data is the straight, upward-sloping region during which the system was undergoing constant acceleration. With the hand tool showing, click anywhere on the figure and drag to pan it so that your data is aligned with the left-hand side. Then mouse over the horizontal axis until the double arrow appears. Click and drag to the right to scale the figure horizontally until your data reaches the right-hand side of the figure. You may need to pan and scale again to tightly fit the data within the figure. You may need to move one or more of the boxes out of the way of the figure so that all of your data is visible. Click the button with the yellow highlighter and three blue dots on it. This will allow you to select only the portion of your data that you wish to analyze a selection box will appear. Pan the box so that the lower left corner includes your first data point. Then click and drag the upper right corner so that the entire box includes your last relevant data point. You may need to move a box out of the way so that it is visible. This figure looks quite good, except there is an issue with the linear fit. In this case, the slope is reported out to three decimal places, but the error is in the fourth decimal place. To fix this, right-click on the box, then select Curve Fit Properties, click Numerical Format, and then click Coefficients, and then increase the number of significant figures from 3 to 4. Click OK. This is now a good figure and is worth including in your report. Record the slope of the line. Based on the one-dimensional motion experiment and the fact that this is a graph of velocity versus time, you should understand the significance of the slope. We need to repeat this process for the remaining trials. To select another run, click the drop-down menu next to the multicolored triangle in the toolbar. Select a run you haven't analyzed yet. Repeat all previous steps. Pan, Scale, Pan, Scale, Highlight Data, Adjust Boxes, Fix the Significant Figures, and then record the value of the slope. Once you have finished all 10 trials, graph your slope versus your mass difference in graphical analysis and report on the significance of that graph.